Good morning, church. <clears throat> this is Psalm 34 of David when he changed his behavior before Amalek so that he drove him out and he went away. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul makes its boast in the Lord. Let the humble hear and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. Yay! I sought the Lord and he answered me and delivered me from all of my fears. Those who look to him are radiant and their faces shall never be ashamed. This poor lady cried out and the Lord heard her and saved her out of all of her troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and delivers them. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. Oh, fear the Lord, all of you saints, for those who fear him have no lack. The young lions suffer want and hunger, but those who seek the Lord lack no good thing. Oh, come children, listen to me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. What man is there who desires life and loves many days that he may see good? Keep your tongue from evil and your lips from speaking deceit. Turn from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. The eyes of the Lord are towards the righteous, and he hears his ears toward their cry. The face of the Lord is against those who do evil, to cut off the memory of them from the earth. When the righteous cry for help, the Lord hears and delivers them out of all of their troubles. Salah. The Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves the crushed in spirit. Amen. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers them out of them all. He keeps all of his bones. Not one of them will be broken. Affliction will slay the wicked, and those who hate the righteous will be condemned. The Lord redeems the life of his servants. None of those who take refuge in him will be condemned. This is the word of our Lord. You may be seated. Good morning. You guys doing well? Outstanding. Good to have you with us. Welcome to Desert Breeze Community Church. Also want to welcome those of you that are on YouTube Live right now. Thank you for joining us. Soul Satisfying Psalms is a current teaching series, Taste and See. Taste and See is the title of this weekend's message. If you have your Bibles, you can turn to Psalm 34. We'll be walking through that whole chapter. Also grab your sermon notes out. So, you know, each week I've been saying, this is like my favorite, this is my favorite, and uh, I was thinking, this isn't probably one of my favorites until I started studying it. It is one of my favorites. <laughs> you guys okay with that? Yeah. I mean, this is a good one. This is really a good one. Man, we're going to bask in the reality of God's goodness this morning as we study this. And uh, just, this is, a, this is one of those you want to keep coming back to and maybe memorize a number of the verses here, but we're going to unpack all of this. Let me start by asking you some questions here. You can discuss it with the folks sitting around you if you want. Uh, maybe not. Uh, I, won't <laughs> I won't give you enough time to do that. Just think about it. You can yell out to me if you know the answer to this first one. What company has the slogan, bet you can't eat just one? Lay's potato chips, yeah. Why do they hand out samples at Costco? Because you take a bite, you just, just get that bite, and you're gonna be purchasing the product, maybe too much of that product, just after that little, little snack there. How many have no self-control with chips and salsa? <laughs> show of hands, show of hands. How many are sitting at your favorite Mexican restaurant and you're downloading, you know, woo, absorbing, enjoying, eating too much chips and salsa, you have to put the brakes on before the food comes out. You guys, you know what I'm talking about? Oh my goodness, it's just like, oh, you'll, you'll stuff yourself on chips and salsa. Just go ahead and bring the check right now, never mind the meal. Can I have some of these chips and salsa to go? And so, yeah. Have you ever stood over a cake and nibbled on it until the cake was gone? Just stand over the top of it. I'm just going to have a little slice. Oh, that's good. I'll just have a little bit more. 
a little bit more, and before long, you've devoured a lot of the cake. Maybe it's not cake, it's Mark, uh, Neiman Marcus brownies, or lemon bars, or coconut cream pie. My wife and I have, over the last 20 years, gone to a place over in California. It's Oceanside, California. It's a little place we enjoy staying there. One of the reasons it's close to the beach, and then there's a lot of places within walking distance that we can go to restaurants and coffee shops. One of the coffee shops we enjoy going to that it, that's in that area is called Revolution. First time we went there, they had these maple Pop-Tarts, maple frosting, Pop-Tarts, they're homemade, delicious, really good. But the thing we like most about it is that they had butterscotch lattes. So the last time we went there, this last, this summer, uh, they had these cowboy cookies they were gigantic, and so, oh my goodness, I had to have one of those. It took me about three days to eat it. No, I didn't. I, was, I devoured it right away. So my wife, you know my wife bakes, so she came home and made two dozen of those cowboy cookies that were even better than what I had eaten, and she froze those two dozen, and I've been eating one, maybe two a day to keep the doctor away. Okay, maybe it doesn't keep the doctor away, but man, I'm telling you, they are delicious. Uh, oatmeal, chocolate chips, pecans, coconut, loads of butter, and you know what I'm talking about there. Now, why would I say all of that? It's because the title is Taste and See That the Lord is Good is really what that verse is. That's kind of the key verse here in Psalm 34, 34, 8. Most of us have all memorized that. It's a great verse to memorize. And, and he's using sensory language. This is King David. He's using sensory language to help us understand that Knowing God is not only intellectually sound, but it's experientially satisfying. And one of the things that I've learned through the years, and most of you would agree with that, I think a lot of you would agree with what I'm about to say here, once you've tasted of the goodness of God, you want more of Him, you can't keep quiet about Him, and you want to live your whole life for Him. You guys agree with that? Man, I, I, I'm telling you. And that's just the taste of the goodness of God. But we've got a problem, though, we've got to work through. And, and tasting and understanding the goodness of God will help us to work through that problem. Take a look at your sermon notes here. The problem is that we live in a, very, in a world that is very caustic, critical, and condemning. And so how do you keep from becoming hard, jaded, and cynical, bitter and toxic in a broken world filled with sin and suffering. Hebrews 12, 15 talks about that problem. It actually says, don't let a bitter root grow up and cause trouble in your own life, and then you find yourself defiling the people that are within your life. And it actually tells us in the fourth chapter of Ephesians, verses 26 through 27, this bitterness gives the devil a foothold into our lives. So it's a serious problem. I see it in our, in our culture today, major, major problem. I see this among first responders. I was a first responder for many years. I see that with firefighters and police officers. I've seen this with pastors. They become um, bitter and toxic just through the harshness of life. I've seen this with medical personnel, doctors and nurses. I worked construction for a number of years out of Palo Verde and a lot of uh, guys that would travel from union halls th throughout the United States, but primarily from big cities back east, Philadelphia, New York, and Chicago. And what I found, a kind of a common denominator with some of these guys is that they were horribly harsh, hardcore, they came out of an environment was, that was dog-eat-dog. Dog. There was a real toxicity and a bitterness and an attitude with them. And uh, I, I see that in our culture in politics. There's such hatefulness and divisiveness and attacking. And uh, we had, maybe some of you remember, there was a couple that attended Desert Breeze. They got saved here. They worked for CBS News. Is Brian and Allison Mims, and uh, you guys probably remember them. Great people. They got saved here, and this is what he told me. They did a lot of different video stuff for us. 
But he said he's never been around a group of people that were more toxic and bitter than the newscasters and the people that were the reporters out there dealing with all of the sin and suffering in this world. And so what we've got to do is we've got to learn to really protect our heart against all of this. Take a look at your sermon notes here. Bitterness is an unhealthy defense mechanism to keep us from being hurt anymore. It is a sinful survival instinct. So we live in a hard world. We become hard as a result of that to build the defense mechanisms. And it's bitterness, it's toxicity. We give the devil a foothold in our life. So the only problem when we develop this defense mechanism of, of hardness, being, becoming jaded and cynical, it's, it is a defense mechanism. The only problem is that this wall of bitterness not only keeps the bad at bay, keeps the bad out or the hurt out, but it also keeps the good out, the healing out. It keeps us from being healed. So we've got to learn really a good sense of boundaries in our life where we let the good in but keep the bad out, be able to discern the difference between the two. And, I, and I've, one of the ways that I can tell when people have become bitter, jaded, cynical is when they use extreme statements like they were heard in a church experience and they'll say, I'll never go back to church again. Forget the church. Forget the pastors, those leaders. And, and so they'll, they'll make statements like that. It's pretty extreme, by the way, when people say that. That's just evidence of bitterness that you're hurt. I understand that, but don't, don't let it make you become bitter. Let it make you become better so that you can become more discerning so you don't ca- throw the baby out with the bathwater. I've seen the same thing with my wife and I know a, a gal, been married 20 years uh, to a guy who was a pastor who was getting his counseling a degree. He was becoming a counselor, crashed his own marriage, and she, he was narcissistic, manipulative, which is crazy, and, uh, and him getting his counseling degree, and, and she divorced him, left him, and she said to us, I'll never get married again. She's currently living with a guy, and um, she's bitter. She's hurt. She's devastated. She didn't respond to that appropriately. Yeah, I understand. Bad situation, even though he was a pastor and he was seeking his counseling degree. So when you hear those extreme statements, it's just evidence of bitterness. And so here's the key. The key to keeping your heart from becoming bitter and toxic is to develop a lifestyle of praise, a lifestyle of thankfulness, gratitude. I mean, look at the very first verse of this text. Psalm 34, 1. <laughs> I love this verse. This is a good memory verse. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. Wow. You're going to bless the Lord. You're going to adore God at all times, and His praise will continually be in your mouth? Why is that? Why would He do that? Because He has tasted and He has seen that the Lord is good. So he can do that because it's not a denial of reality, but it's a declaration that God is bigger than his reality. And so he's able to live in the reality of that. So 1 Thessalonians 5.18, which goes along with that, says, give thanks in all circumstances because this is God's will in Christ Jesus concerning you. Give thanks in all circumstances? Not for all circumstances, but in all circumstances. Why is that? Because God, who is in you, loves you, cares for you, will take care of you, is greater than anything you'll ever face. That's why he's able to do it. That's why he's able to start off this psalm by saying, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise will continually be in my mouth. And that comes from tasting and seeing that the Lord is good. Why would he do that? Because he knows that God is better than any pleasure and bigger than any problem in life. Now, uh, let me give you a, a quote. This is a bit of a long intro, okay? Just, just to let you know, you guys, sometimes they're long, sometimes they're short, mostly long. And uh, and so this is kind of a long one, we'll get, we'll get to prayer. You always know I'm finished with my intro when we get to prayer. We haven't gotten there yet, but I want to give you a, a quote from C.S. Lewis from Reflections on the Psalms, a word about praising. These are just excerpts. It was too long for me to quote all of it, but let me look up on the big screen here. And listen to what he says. All enjoyment spontaneously overflows into praise. 
We delight to praise what we enjoy because it expresses and completes the enjoyment. Do you guys agree with that? Yeah, I mean, you're, you're eating, you know, something very delicious. You're going to express that to us. Oh, my goodness, this is the best I've ever tasted before. Oh, this is good. Or look at that sunset or look at that sunrise or any number of things. Um, we delight to praise what we enjoy because it expresses and completes the enjoyment. Now, notice what he says here. The humblest and at the same time most balanced and capacious just means gracious. Gracious minds praise most. Notice the contrast here. While cranks, misfits, and malcontents praise least. So he's just saying, he's saying bitter and toxic people aren't going to praise much. But people that are healthy praise a lot. That's just, that's health. In fact, praise is inner health made audible. So we should be the kind of people that just, we praise a lot because of who we are, who Christ is, and what we have in Him in all circumstances, in all circumstances. Now, let me give you some background to this text, this chapter. This psalm was written after David's two near-death experiences. So you'd think, a dude that goes through two near-death experiences, by the way, he knew that he had a calling on his life to be the king, and yet the current king was trying to kill him. So he's running for his life. David is running from King Saul, who's trying to kill him, and he runs right into the camp of the arch enemy of Israel, where the king of Gath nearly kills him. But, but, but he acts a little bit crazy in this, in this particular situation, so the king, the king of Gath chases him away, just says, ah, don't bother him, he's crazy in the head. And I'll talk a little bit more about what that means maybe in light of this text. But this psalm is an explosion of praise to God. So it's, that's what it's teaching us, taste and see that the Lord is good. So here's where we're going with the study. What isn't praise, you can see this on your notes, what is praise and what does it look like and how does it benefit us? That's the last part of it, but let's first pray. Would you bow your heads with me? Okay, I'm finished with my intro. There you go. And now we're going to pray and ask God to help us to apply this to our lives this weekend. So, Father God, thank you for this morning. Thank you that we, we can encounter you, that we can know you. That's the greatest desire of our heart is to cultivate intimacy with you, to, to get to know you. Lord Jesus, we want to taste and see that you are good. The greatest expression of your goodness is the cross. It tells us in Romans 5, 8 that, that you demonstrate your love for us in this while we were still sinners. You died for us. That is amazing. That's breathtaking. We are thankful that the gospel is not only intellectually sound, it's head sound, but it's also heart satisfying. It's experientially satisfying. And the key to keeping our hearts from becoming bitter and toxic in this broken world is to develop a lifestyle of praise, of thankfulness and gratitude that comes from tasting and seeing that you are good. Teach us what that, what that isn't and what it is and what it looks like and the innumerable benefits it brings into our lives. We pray these things in your beautiful name, and everyone said, amen. So what isn't praise? First of all, first fill in the blank, it isn't positive confession. It's not like stroking a rabbit's foot by which we hope to tap into a supernatural power that will bring relief to our lives. That's not what it is. Nor is it the power of positive thinking a psychological improvement of your attitude by focusing on the positive things so that the negative things in life don't seem so bad. Now, if you're feeling the blank, look up here just for a moment. You need to understand this, that whatever negative things you're facing, the positive things we have in Christ is always greater, okay? So, so it's not this idea like you need to think about the positive things so that the negative things don't seem so bad. Listen, the, the negative things aren't so bad in light of turning your eyes upon Jesus. When you begin to know who it is that walks through your day with you, never to leave you or forsake you, those positive things will get you through anything. So, but it's not this power of positive thinking. It's, it's actually a reality. 
So it's not a denial of the reality, it's a declaration that He's bigger than the reality is what we're talking about here. That's what true praise is. So when people counsel you and say, hey, you need to not think about the negative things, just think about the positive things, well, <laughs> it's, it's not some technique, it's a person you encounter and you know that He's with you and you're going to get through it, and yeah, it's pretty negative what you're going through, but He's bigger, He's adequate, He's going to take care of you, His grace is sufficient. And not only that, and, and I talked about this last weekend, is that peace is not the absence of problems, but what? It's the presence of, of Christ. So I'm just saying it's not the power of positive thinking. It's, it's more than that. It's encounter with Jesus. It's knowing Him and experiencing Him. Here's the last one. It's not patronizing God. A complimenting or charming of God in an effort to gain His favor by soothing or massaging His heavenly ego. That's called paganism, folks. That's not biblical. We're going to appease the gods so they'll take the heat off and maybe bring the blessing that we all want. That's nonsense. That's not how God relates to us. And so it's important to get that out of the way. So what, what is praise? And so we need to know praise as it, uh, as it differs from worship. So I got worship there, the definition of worship for you. Worship is ascribing ultimate worth and value to God in such a way that it engages and energizes your whole person, whole person, mind, captivates your mind, stirs your emotions, moves you to action. You're living for His glory. It is a lifestyle. It's your whole life. In fact, I gave you some verses to help you to understand that. Romans 12.1, Paul spends 11 chapters talking about the beauty and the glory of Christ through the gospel. It is breathtaking. And then he says in chapter 12, I appeal to you, brothers, in light of God's mercies, in light of God's greatness and goodness, give your lives as a living sacrifice to God, which is your reasonable way to worship Him. It's just, it just makes sense. This is just your nat natural way. When you understand His goodness, you want to live your life for Him. I mean, it's just normal. This is what he's saying. In fact, uh, Jesus is talking to the woman at the well and saying that uh, true worshipers will worship in spirit and truth, for they are the kind of worship worshipers the Father desires. And spirit and truth basically means spirit means your whole life, your whole heart, every part of you. And truth, truth would be consistent with how God has revealed Himself to us. You just can't make up a God and think that's the true and living God. He's already revealed Himself to us through creation and through His Word. And so you relate to Him based on how He's revealed Himself to you. That, so that's worship. And so worship involves your prayer life, praise, Bible study, giving of your time, money, talents, fellowship, communion, career, family, every part of your life, every part of you. You want to honor Him, live for His glory. You were created by God for God, for a relationship with God, Amen. to reveal the glory of God through your life in all your decisions, whether you eat or drink, whatever you do, do all to the glory of God, 1031 of 1 Corinthians. Do it all for His glory. Oh, my goodness, nothing will satisfy your soul more than to live for Him, to live for His glory. That's worship. Now, praise is part of that. And you can tell a lot of times by uh, whether you're really truly worshiping Him in every aspect of your life, because praise is part of that. So praise, that's your next fill in the blank, is one of the many aspects of worship that includes seven Hebrew words for praise. So praise is not, I just need to tell you up front, praise is not a spectator sport, okay? It's participative, participative, yeah, participative. You participate in praise. You, you are an active praiser of God. That's, that's what he's saying. And so uh, let me give you these words, tahilah, which means sing, dance, praise. That's what that Hebrew word means. It's actually found in the very first verse of our text, Psalm 34. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise, that's that word right there, shall continually be in my mouth. And, and that one word includes all of these that follow also. So it's not just sing, dance, and praise, but halal, where that comes from the word hallelujah, 
And it means, notice what it says, celebrate, boast, rave, clamorously foolish. Clamorously foolish. I don't think it's a coincidence that David is acting crazy here in this uh, setting, in this context, towards the, his arch enemy, the king, and then he kind of says, oh, David's just crazy in the context of praise. I think that, that you should praise God in such a way that sometimes your family members are going to think you're a little bit crazy. <laughs> I think it's okay. It's, it's kind of normal. I know that people think I'm crazy. That guy's just crazy. I, I, no. I'm crazy in love with him. I, I love him. I honor him. I want to live for him. I want to serve him. I, it's just a natural overflow. Man, I've tasted, and I see that he is good. And so, I mean, I mean that's part of it. Zama, sing, play instruments. Shabak, shout, lift up your voice. Barak, bowing, giving reverence. Yada, lifting of hands, reaching out to God. Tauda, extension of the hand. So uh, some of you that come from more of a Baptist background where everybody kind of looks like an ironing board when they're worshiping God. And nothing against you Baptists. I know that sometimes some Baptists will. If you come more from a charismatic background like me, man, everybody's hands in the air. We're like, woo-hoo-hoo. We're acting crazy. But sometimes it's a little bit uncomfortable if you don't come from that environment. Sorry, I didn't mean to offend any of you that came from more of, a, more of that kind of background. But it, it, it is odd to me because I'm thinking, man, get your hands out of your pocket. Lift them up. Praise God. What, what are you concerned about? You worry about them? Man, you need to be thinking about Him. It's like it just, I mean, it's, it's right here. It's just saying this is, this is normal praising of God. Lifting hands, reaching out to God. Extension of the hand, that tout is t- extension of the hand. Thanksgiving for things not yet received, sacrifice of praise. It's like, man, right now my life is going really bad, but I know he's up to something good, and I'm going to praise him. Does that make sense? So you're like, it doesn't matter. He's in control. I love him. I don't like the political climate right now, but he's still in control. I love him. He's up to something really great. Because he'll never let us down. He's working. See, that's, that's just normal. That's healthy praise. Now, people who have never darkened the door of the church should be breaking down the doors of the church to find out what all the celebration is about. Based on my understanding of worship and and praise, when our praise is as glorious as the one we praise, it will attract even those whose hearts are hardened towards God. I'm convinced of that. Now, Let me just say that I've seen all seven of these Hebrew words expressed at a Arizona Cardinals game, (laughs) in a Diamondbacks game, and also in the Summer Olympics just recently. I mean, when I, I was watching some of the races, and, and I, one of my favorite sports is the, the Summer Olympics with the uh, track and field. And man, when watching some of the track and field runners and all of that, I mean, people are raising their hands, they're celebrating, they're high-fiving, they're, they're yelling, they're proclaiming, they're, I mean, that's, that's normal. And so, I'm good with that, but if you do that at those games for your favorite sporting events, and yet you come to church and you're like an ironing board, anybody know what an ironing board is? Okay, yeah. Uh, some of you need to buy one, okay? I've, I still iron my shirts. I iron my clothes. Anybody still iron their clothes? Oh, okay, there's a couple of you. <laughs> okay, don't be like an ironing board. Jesus, I really love you. I'm just really excited this morning. Praise God, you're everything to me. It's like, come on. Loosen up. He's here. He loves you. He wants you to know Him. He will manifest His presence to you. And so, so here's my question. Do these seven Hebrew words reflect your life when it comes to praising God? Would people say that you are more excited about God than anything else in life? 
Think about when you're excited about things. And I'm not against you being excited about maybe a new car or clothes or home or job or favorite, you know, rock movie, athletic star, favorite sports team or your country, favorite country band or Christian band or or whatever it is. Nothing wrong with that. But do you have greater excitement for that than you do for him? I did something a number of years ago. Don't, Don't hate on me because of this, okay? Don't, don't. Don't be upset because there's probably still people in this church that might be still upset over this, and, and that's why I talk about bitterness, okay? So anyway, uh, you guys remember the 2001 Diamondbacks when they won the World Series? Anybody, uh, anybody old enough? That some, okay. And so do you guys remember who hit that little blooper to the left field that brought the runner around, and then Diamondbacks beat the New York Yankees? That was good, huh? Anybody remember who that was? Luis Gonzalez, Luis Gonzalez hit that. Well, my wife and I were at a restaurant, and Luis Gonzalez was sitting over another table. He saw us praying, so he came over and said, hey, I saw you pray. I'm a Christian. I said, that's cool. And I said, so hey, what do you think? Uh, He he asked me. He said, I told him I was a pastor. He goes, oh, that's great. I'd love to come over to your church sometime and talk to the people. I said, why don't you come this next weekend? So I invited him that next weekend, and so I was was up. This is when we were in the nightclub over here, and I said to everybody, I said, you're not going to believe this, but I ran into Luis Gonzalez, and he is here this morning, and he's going to come up on the stage and he's going to just share a few thoughts. And the people stood up and began to give him a standing ovation. And I said, no, he's not actually really here. I said, I was lying. Don't hate on me. But then I said, someone here more important than Luis Gonzalez. Someone is here who's more important than Luis Gonzalez this morning, and it's the Lord Jesus Christ. And, he, and, go, and, and then they really, of course, they better. And they... <laughs> And then they go to, I mean, everybody was like, woo you better do that. But there's a few that are still hating on me because of that, okay. That's why I'm talking about bitterness here this morning, just in case you're still harboring that bitterness towards me because I did that. I know that was rude, that was ugly, but I made a point, didn't I? <laughs> Pastor Ray, you lied. Okay, I did. I'm sorry. Jesus already forgave me. He was making a point. He was making a point. And so my question for you is that, do you show more excitement and enthusiasm when it comes to Jesus more so than anything else? Nothing, I'm, there's nothing wrong with being excited about things. They get excited about stuff. I was really excited about when my wife made those cowboy cookies. I get excited when I pull one out of the freezer, throw it in the microwave for 30 seconds, put a scoop of ice cream on top of it. Oh, man. I'm... Hey, by the way, I think we should, when it comes to creation, we should be the most excited people in the world because we know that every good and perfect gift comes from Him, and so we don't let our adoration and praise terminate on the gift. We let it roll on up to the gift giver and celebrate Him, that He gave us these taste buds. We can enjoy these great foods all for His glory. I already mentioned it, 1 Corinthians 10, 31, whether you eat or drink, whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Praise God. Praise God. I, I want to, I'm going to share with you a quote from, take a look at this quote up on the screen by Sidney McLaughlin Levroni, one of my favorite runners, and she, uh, she won two gold medals in the Tokyo Olympics. In this Paris Olympics, she won two gold medals, broke the record in the 400-meter hurdles in, in both the Tokyo and the Paris Olympics. Anybody see her run? Just a few of us, not very, many of you probably maybe watch it. Oh my goodness, she just runs at ease. She is, she's a lover of Jesus though. And I want, I want to read this quote from her. Listen to what it says. What I have in Christ is far greater than what I have or don't have in life. He has prepared me for a moment such as this, that I may use the gifts He has given me to point all the attention back to Him. So if you ever hear her testimony, she's, when they're interviewing, she always says, hey, you know what? In fact, not too long ago, they were asking, how do you prepare for a race? She goes, well, I, I usually meditate on Scripture. I love it. 
And then she would even share the scripture she was meditating on. I've been meditating on the scripture, and I know the Lord's with me. It doesn't mean that everything's going to always go well, but it doesn't matter if it does or doesn't because he's always with me, and he loves me. And I was just amazing testimony. I was like, oh, my goodness, this girl's dialed in. She knows it. She's got it. She's living for his glory. She realizes that her giftedness has been given to her by God, and she's putting that on display, using that as a platform to make much of him. She also said in another quote, I would take my relationship with Christ over a gold medal any day. So let me ask you this. What she's doing here is praising. This is called praise, adoration to God. Yeah, this is good, this is important, but nothing compared to what I have in Him. So do you talk like that? Do you make much of Jesus around your family and friends? See, that's what they need to hear more than anything. See, quotes like that stir my heart. They go, oh, yeah, you're right on. I mean, let let me say it again. What I have in Christ is far greater than what I have or don't have in life. Do you believe that? How many believe that? I do. Do you say that to yourself and do you say that to others? No matter what my circumstances are, what I have in him is, is better by far. He's greater. I can deal with anything because he's for me. He's not against me. He loves me. That's praise. I mean, that's, that's what we need to be doing. Do you talk about how great he is and what he can do in and through their lives, the people's lives that you're around? If you are not gospel fluent or praise fluent in your thoughts to yourself, then you won't be in your speech around others and in your evangelism reaching unbelievers and in your discipleship in building believers. You are what you love. You talk about what you love and you praise what you prize or you prize what you praise. Kind of works hand in hand. You always praise what you most prize. Are there times in your life in walking, knowing, experiencing Christ that you can't keep quiet about him. If not, then you're probably not growing and experiencing him like you could. This is an invitation. Taste and see that the Lord is good. I mean, that's what he's saying. Oh, exclamation mark. That's praise. We should be doing that regularly around each other and get really good at it. And so look at the next couple fill in the blanks. Praise is tasting and seeing that the Lord is good. That's what it is. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Exclamation mark. Blessed, total fulfillment, complete well-being is the man who takes refuge in him. Refuge means you trust in him, you hope in him. Hope is not wishful thinking. It's competent, joyful expectation. Let me give you another quote from C.S. Lewis on praise. Um, Listen to what he says. In commanding us to glorify him, by the way, C.S. Lewis, when he read the Bible, he felt like, this is weird. Why is God commanding us to praise him? Well, he, God doesn't need our praise, but it's actually more for us. But in commanding us to glorify him, God is inviting us to enjoy him. We must praise God or live in, notice this, live in unreality and poverty. If you don't praise him, you're living in unreality. You're not in touch with reality because he is that good. He is that great. He is bigger than any problem. You're not living in reality if you're not praising him, and you're living in poverty. You're living way below what he's provided for you. We cannot merely believe in our minds that he is loving or wise or great. Notice what he says. He really gives us the technique here, or not a technique, but how to how to experience more of him. We must praise him for those things and praise him to others. So praise him to ourselves in private so that in public we're praising him to others if we are to move beyond abstract knowledge to heart-changing engagement. So 
So what do we praise him for? Praise God for who he is. I daily praise him for who he is. God, you are the creator, the sustainer of the heavens and the earth. You're the God of the galaxies who came from heaven to earth, died in my place for my sins to set me free from sin and death and evil. Thank you, Lord, for that. So I praise him for who he is, what he's done, what he is doing, and what he will do in my life and what he's doing through my life. I praise him for all of that. That's what you praise him for. And you do it regularly, consistently. Praise is joyful preoccupation with God. Praise paves a way for God's manifested presence. Remember the last couple of weeks I've talked about the difference between the omnipresence of God and the manifested presence of God. Psalm 22.3 says, God inhabits the praises of his people. Psalm 104 says, Verse 4, we enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. So think about this just for a minute. Imagine you wake up every morning and you just enjoy being his. You don't get stressed out about what's ahead of you that day or what you've got to do or you get all worked up. No, man, you just, you wake first thing, Lord, I'm just so thankful that I'm yours and I'm divinely designed. I'm deeply desired. I'm lavishly loved by you. I mean, you're talking this to him you're, because you, that's a reality. You're living in reality. You're not living in poverty anymore. You're going to experience more of him. You're fully forgiven. You're a sacred story of his amazing grace. He wants you to shine his glory into every dark circumstance of your life, into every person in your life that desperately needs to see him and know him. See, when you do that, You are living and becoming what he paid for on the cross. He bled and died so that we could experience all of that and more. That's why this psalm starts off by saying, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. So, Praise is a bridge between heaven's throne and earth's need. It destroys the atmosphere in which defeat and discouragement flourish. I've seen that happen in my own life. I've seen it happen in other people's lives. I've seen people come from outside, come in here during a worship time, and their spirit elevated, boom, just like that, as they begin to think and reflect and praise God. Coming out of darkness into light. That light of God dispels the darkness in their life, the depression, the disappointment. The kingdom of God crowds out the efforts of hell in our lives through praise. It's no coincidence that the nation of Israel under King David's leadership made the greatest advances militarily at the same time of their highest development in praise and worship. It's the greatest spiritual warfare that you could ever do to create an atmosphere of praise and worship. It invites the manifested presence of God into your life. It's not the bad things that happen to us that determine our destiny. It's our response. It's how we respond to them. It's Christ who defines who we are and determines how well we are doing, not your circumstances. Think about this. If he is for you, who can be against you? If God is for you, who can be against you? By the way, Paul wrote that eighth chapter. That's a phenomenal chapter. I mean, he's just giving innumerable accounts of how much God is for us in that chapter, just out of this world. And he's in kind of about halfway through, he just goes, oh my goodness, are you kidding me? If God is for you, who can be against you? If he didn't spare his own son, taking care of your worst problem, he's not going to spare anything else and take care of you now. It's gospel logic is what he's using there. It's... it's, uh, it's Romans eight thirty one and 32. So what you have in Christ is far greater than what you have or don't have in life. I mean, so regularly you should be thinking, I mean, here's just would be normal praise throughout the day. Thank you, Lord. 
Thank you, Lord, my days of emptiness, loneliness, and significance have ended forever because of you. You fill me with your presence. You will never leave me or forsake me. Lord, you give me a meaning and a hope and a happiness that is out of this world. It's incomparable to anything else I could experience in this life. Can you see if you begin to do that, praise him, love him, enjoy him, it invites his presence, his light dispels the darkness in your life, man, it it helps you through the day. It helps you through the week. And uh, we're just about finished, and so I was going to have you put the rest of this in a to-go box. <laughs> you know, when you have too much food, you don't eat it all right there, to-go box. And so I'll, I'll just walk through some of this. We're almost finished. And so I, I would encourage you, there is no shortage of resources that we provide for you, so you should be basking in the reality of all that God is throughout the week just by taking the sermon notes and the growing notes and, and then going online and listening to our DB devotional that we do. Typically, our DB devotional is about the text that we've learned the previous week. So I encourage you to do that. So what does it look like and how does it benefit us? Let me it'll take about a minute to walk through some of this. Let's do that. Psalm 92.1, it just tells us that it is good, it is beneficial to praise the Lord and make music to your name almost high. Look at verses two through three. My soul makes its boast in the Lord. Let the humble hear and, and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. It reinvigorates the life of God and others. Verse four, I sought the Lord and he answered me and he delivered me from all of my fears. It relieves me from anxieties. How many have been relieved from anxiety because of your encounter with Christ, knowing him, you've come to him? Absolutely, so that's part of your testimony. Tell people that are stressed out, you know what, he's helped me with my anxieties, he can help you too. That's what David is saying here, that's praise. He can help you too, let me pray with you. He can help to relieve your anxieties, that's what he's saying. Look at verse five, those who look to him are radiant. I can always tell when, when people have been looking to God because they're, they're radiant. There's just something about their life. He's just saying that. Those who look to him are radiant. Their faces are never, shall never be ashamed. In other words, he removes all the guilt and shame and condemnation in our life. It's amazing. Oh, my goodness. It rejuvenates my life. Look at verses 6 and 7. This poor man cried, and the Lord heard him and saved him out of his troubles. The angel, notice he says, he doesn't say an angel. Anytime in the Old Testament it says an angel, it's talking about an angel. But when it says the angel of the Lord, it's talking about who? It's talking about Jesus. So the angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him. It's really, he's talking about a Christophany here. And you see it throughout the Old Testament. Anytime it uses the word the angel of the Lord, encamps around those who fear him and delivers them. So it refocuses me on God who is bigger than any circumstance I face. And then verse 8, oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. Let me just say this. If your relationship with God is boring, it's because you're not living this verse. You're not tasting and seeing that he is good. This will transform you, heal you, satisfy you like nothing else. It relishes the goodness of God. It relishes the goodness of God. And then verses 9 through 14, he's going to talk about fear here. Fear of God is is not being afraid of God, it's to tremble at the privilege of knowing Him and walking with Him and enjoying Him. It's also a joyful awe and wonder of the beauty and the glory of who He is and what He's done for you that ruins you for anything else. So, oh, fear the Lord, you His saints, for those who fear Him have no lack. The young lions suffer want and hunger, but those who seek the Lord lack no good thing. Come, O oh children, listen to me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. And he's going to talk about that. What man is there who desires life and loves many days that he may see good? You want to get the most out of your life? Fear the Lord is what he's saying. Keep your tongue from evil and your lips from speaking deceit. And we know this in the Bible that your words our window into your heart. So he's just saying, man, watch your heart. See what comes out of your mouth. That's showing that you're not truly living for an audience of one. You don't have fear of God in your life. He says, turn away from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. So it respects God above anything and everything. Verses 15 through 16, the eyes of the Lord are toward the righteous and his ears toward their cry. I remember this every morning when I spend time with him. I always go back to this verse. So you're not just talking to the ceiling, 
You're not just talking to the wall. The eyes of the Lord are toward the righteous. He's, he's, he sees you, and he leans in, and he hears you. The face of the Lord is against those who do evil to cut off the memory of them from the earth. So it reinforces our faith. Verse 17 through 20, we're almost finished. When the righteous cry out for help, the Lord hears and delivers them out of all of their troubles. The Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves the crushed in spirit. I, I quote that verse more often when I'm up here praying for people than any other verse. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. He, he keeps all of his bones. Not one of them will be broken. Anybody ever have a broken bone? I guess this verse doesn't apply to you. I'm kidding. Actually, what we have, we'd have to understand the implications of that, but actually he's speaking prophetically of Jesus. He didn't have a bone broken. And so, it restores my broken life. Verses 21 and 22. Affliction will slay the wicked, and those who hate the righteous will be condemned. The Lord redeems the, redeems the life of his servants. None of those who take refuge in him will be condemned. He relinquishes. So, praise is relinquishing final judgment to God. Woo, that is good stuff. <laughs> Taste to see that the Lord is good. So, next weekend, we will end this series Song in the dark. What do you do when you feel God is distant and detached or you feel like He's abandoned you? How do you deal with that? Psalm 42 helps us with that. If you, if you struggle with depression, we're going to talk about that. Psalm 42. We're finishing this series one week early because on Labor Day weekend we have a guest speaker in here. Some of you have heard him before in our uh, faith, family, and freedom group. He's going to come in and he's going to really talk about the foundation of civic involvement, our, our responsibility in voting, and he's going to help us to navigate the current political climate with really a biblical worldview. And you're going to hear me talk more about that as we head towards the election. Really important info that we need to understand here if we're going to be responsible and Christ-like and have an impact in our world today. So that's where we're headed. And I'll be up front at the end of the service along with any available elders and leaders. If you're new, we'd love to meet you. If you need prayer, I'd love to pray with you. If you don't know Jesus, I'd love to pray with you to commit your life to Him. Most important decision you could make. And if you've got any questions, I'd love to answer those questions for you. Why don't you stand with me? Let me send you out of here with a blessing. Here's my blessing for you. You can close your eyes. You can keep your eyes open. Here's my blessing for you. I pray in Jesus' name that you would keep your heart from becoming bitter, toxic in our broken world by developing a lifestyle of praise that you would bless the Lord at all times and His praise would continually be in your mouth as you learn more and more every day to taste and see that the Lord is good, causing you to want more of Him, to not be able to keep quiet about Him, and to live your whole life completely for Him, all for His glory. In Jesus' beautiful name, and everyone said... Amen. Love you guys. God bless you.